Today we're going to be looking at another video by Real Engineering, specifically the problem with nuclear fusion. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Foles. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. Nuclear fusion has been a pipe dream for decades. Always 20 years away, never 19. <laughs> I've heard that one myself. Yes, always 20 years away. It was something that regularly gets brought up within the industry, or should I say the fission side of things. I actually had a professor that taught fusion, and he kind of looked like a depressed Santa Claus in those Christmas movies where nobody believes in him anymore. It's easy to get jaded about this technology and write it off as impossible. Especially when impossible. nuclear fission already exists and is being underutilized. Now that's one thing, there's not really a conflict between the two. It's not like you're competing for the same resources for fission versus fusion. It's two completely separate processes. Because fission, you're splitting apart really heavy nuclei, and fusion, you're combining really small nuclei. So as far as the active ingredient in the reactor portion, you're not really competing. Though, I guess in terms of building a power station, since it's all a means to boil water and have steam, turn a turbine to turn a generator to make electricity, I guess in that sense you are, but fusion and fission are no more the same category than nuclear power and natural gas. Plus, by the end of this video, I hope I can change that feeling and get you as excited as I am about the potential of this technology. Then why'd you title your video The Problem with Nuclear Fusion instead of saying The Potential with Nuclear Fusion? Maybe he changed the title. I don't know. This video is uh, about a year old. If we, as a civilization, actually pull it off and invent a cost-effective nuclear fusion power plant, it would change the face of society. Clean, safe fuels will allow every country in the world to benefit from this technology. I'm excited too, but that is to say, that's a bit of a leap in logic there because we have developed fission, clean, sustainable, green technology, but it hasn't been implemented everywhere. And there's still some debates on whether or not it's green, just like I'm assuming there'd be debates on whether or not fusion is green. And there's even debates on whether or not solar and wind are actually green. I'd like to see it, don't get the wrong idea, but that's, to me, that seemed like a bit of a leap in logic. Allowing countries around the world to be energy independent, preventing one of the leading causes of conflicts around the world as we fight for control of energy sources. Cheap, reliable and abundant energy is the foundation of every sci-fi utopian society. <laughs> it will solve it. our issues with climate change, allow us to electrify industries that require fossil fuels like steel smelting, allow us to create entirely new industries that have been held back by energy costs like water desalination. The thing is, this isn't anything that fission couldn't do, but fission and fusion together I'd like to see. Talking about energy dependencies, because it really just comes down to electricity. Technically, natural gas could do this to replace coal and it'd be that much more environmentally friendly, but natural gas has got nothing in terms of uh, environmental impact savings and life savings compared to nuclear, whether it be fission or fusion. Providing the world with fresh, clean water to irrigate our lands, and turn barren wastelands to fertile pastures, ushering in an era of clean, safe abundance, a utopian future that has been <laughs> dreamed of for decades. I can tell he's exaggerating at this. ...have been underway since the very earliest years of the Cold War, with the first generators firing up in the 1950s in both the USA and USSR. The Soviet Union approached the problem with the tokamak design, while the Americans used a slightly different approach, the Stellarator. Each design attempts to solve the same problem. Fusion, in essence, isn't terribly complicated. We can make new elements by combining mm -hmm. smaller elements, and in the process, release a lot of energy. However, to successfully combine elements, we need to overcome the electromagnetic repulsion, like pushing two north poles of a magnet together. Atoms will repel each other. In order to force them together, 
we need to input a tremendous amount of energy. I like that he explains it fairly simple, because after all, you're just putting stuff together with fusion. With fission, you're splitting stuff apart. Um, with coal, you're just burning rocks. Natural gas, you're just burning gas. When it all comes down to it, all means of producing energy are pretty simple. But we can't just grab individual atoms and force them together like magnets. Instead, we need to create a plasma essentially a cloud of charged ions, which, thanks to their charge, can be manipulated by a magnetic field. We can then confine the plasma with a magnetic field, preventing the ions from hitting the fusion generator walls, and gradually raise its temperature to extremely high temperatures. So for any fusion reaction, you really just need three things. Really high temperature, really high pressure, and enough time, enough confinement time to achieve ignition being the self-sustaining fusion reaction. And the reason why we're using magnets is because gravity is not strong enough on Earth. The sun doesn't have to use magnets just because its gravity is so high. You don't really see that with stars. But yes, ultra-hot temperatures, magnetic confinement to keep it away from the walls of the reactor so it doesn't lose so much heat. And the amount of heat we're talking on is on the order of hundreds of millions of degrees Celsius. So way, way hotter than a fission reactor, which we're talking the hottest being fuel centerline temperature. Let me think in Celsius, about 1600, 1800 range. So this thing's much hotter, but the fusion's on a much smaller area. So if you're talking about actual power you get from the reactor, it's going to be roughly the same order of magnitude in terms of megawatts. Granted, you're also limited by the size of your turbine, the size of your generator, that sort of thing. Not to say you couldn't make a super powerful fusion reactor, but you just have a massive reactor and theoretically put a bunch of uh, generators in, in parallel <laughs> and see how that works out. Otherwise, melt every solid material in the universe. Raising the temperature of the plasma causes the ions to move faster and faster, raising the ions' kinetic energy so high that their speed alone allows them to punch through the electromagnetic repulsion and collide. Both of these designs, the tokamak and stellarator, use slightly different methods of magnetic field confinement. <laughs> It's funny, the tokamak's like a nice straight donut formation, but the stellarator is like a bent one. <laughs> kind of bent out of shape. The reason for the weird shape in the Stellarator is it's supposed to be more stable. The way all the resultant forces in that magnetic field keep everything confined so you don't need the external plasma current for that design. The trade-off is you have to design this really complicated bent donut looking thing that <laughs> more challenging to fabricate. Also, I'm just thinking as the reactor operator, Trying to operate something like the Stellarator might be a bit more non-intuitive and the startup procedures might be a bit more complicated. But on the other hand, if it's more stable, you could probably run it for longer without having to uh, shut it down for a refueling or a maintenance outage. Trade-offs to consider. Generated by massive superconducting magnets to achieve fusion. The tokamak became the leading design today as a result of a release of information from the USSR on the tokamak design in 1968, which showed a tremendous jump in energy efficiency. However, both designs used the same fuels. The exact reactants we use have a huge effect on how much energy we need to put in. The bigger, more recent ones like um, ITER is, is a tokamak design. What we get out at the end. Most reactions use two isotopes of hydrogen, a regular run-of-the-mill hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus. With I know protium is technically accurate, but everyone in the industry just says hydrogen when referring to hydrogen one. Electron in orbit. We could perform fusion with this kind of hydrogen, but the energy we can extract out of the reaction is very low. You could theoretically perform fusions with uranium and would require an un unheard of amount of energy and would not last long and would be a net loss in terms of energy required versus energy gain. That's that's the whole reason why why certain things are used for fusion like deuterium, tritium, lithium, things of that nature. Instead, we frequently combine deuterium and tritium together, where hydrogen normally has one proton and one electron and no neutrons. Deuterium has one proton 
one electron and one neutron, while tritium has one proton, one electron, and two neutrons. One thing to be aware of, he keeps bringing up the electron. I mean, that's true when looking at the atom, but in nuclear reactions, you're really just looking at the nucleus and that the amount of energy it takes, because you're, you're heating this up to plasma state. Yeah, that electron is just going to go flying somewhere else and be irrelevant <laughs> when you're going to cause fusion. The electron's not involved in the actual fusion reaction. This combination is used for a couple of reasons. First, it has the largest probability of giving us the exact result we want. Other reactions, like a regular hydrogen, hydrogen to hydrogen reaction, have a very high probability of creating helium-2, which is unstable yeah, and almost instantly that don't last decays long. into two regular hydrogens again and releases very little energy in the process. I love the animation for fusion, the little pop that he did. That's, that's pretty good. They have a lower probability of combining to form deuterium, the reaction we actually want. And again, I know he's showing the electrons because he's just showing that they're atoms, isotopes. Yeah, to create the, con the heat for conditions, especially for something weird and unstable like that, yeah, those electrons are going somewhere. <laughs> then go on to fuse to form helium-3 and finally helium-4. This is the reaction chain that powers the sun, but the sun has an unfathomable amount of particles making the probability issue completely irrelevant. And the crushing gravity yeah, needed the gravity to and create the... the conditions needed for fusion. That's true, he brings up the uh just the sheer volume and mass of the core, the sun being that much bigger. You can't make something that big on Earth. So that does, that whole probability thing, you just, you have more uh, pulls at your, at your slot machine here, more shots on your Mon Monte Carlo simulation. That, that's a good point you brought up. We need to supply those particles and the energy needed to combine them ourselves. And if we can't extract more energy than we put in, that's just a science experiment. Back to the sun, that's also why it's relatively cold at 15 million degrees Celsius as opposed to hundreds of millions of degrees Celsius. That's not considered cold fusion, but I guess you could just say colder fusion versus what we'd have to try to do on Earth. Not an energy source. We have successfully created many, many fusion reactions here on Earth. In fact, I witnessed the bright pink flashes of fusion myself is he blurring it out? It's a top secret. Visiting Helion recently. We know how to achieve fusion. The problem Does he work we are for now Helion? trying to solve is lowering the energy we need to Does input we? while maximizing the energy we can extract. So, step one, we need fuels that just mean humanity. less energy input that release more energy. That's where deuterium and tritium come in. When combined, they have a very high probability of creating helium-4 and release, on average, 17.6 mega electron volts for each and every fusion event. To give you a sense of scale, fissioning a uranium-235 releases about 200 mega electron volts. That 17.6 is impressive considering how small helium-4 is, whereas uranium is a much bigger 235 as opposed to 4. So if you're looking at your per atomic mass unit of energy, the helium's more, looking at it per reaction, the, the uranium's gonna be more. For comparison, uranium-235 produces 11.4 oh. times <laughs> I didn't this realize energy was gonna say that. for each fission event. <laughs> but on a mass basis, that deuterium-tritium fusion reaction releases over four times as much energy Guess as uranium we fission. Didn't mean a double talk over here. <laughs> no dangerous radioactive products. Helium is actually quite- Now what's interesting, he mentions dangerous fission products and that's true that's the actual um dangerous component or i guess you could say higher dose component technically anything is dangerous if you don't know what you're doing is my logic but the uh, the fission products are will result in the most dose and those are the the highest level of radioactive r waste the spent fuel pool or, or the spent fuel it's not uranium, it's the fission products. Cesium-137, strontium-90, iodine-131, things of that nature. But with fusion, it's more of the reactants, the tritium, which is radioactive, but it does exist. It does exist naturally in, in water. I mean, it's hydrogen. Hydrogen's the most common element in the universe, but trace amounts of it exist just because it's a 
form of hydrogen. But in terms of volume of dangerous stuff, fusion's not nearly as much, but it's interesting. It's the reactants versus the products that are where the uh, radiological hazard lies. A useful byproduct. Deuterium is fairly common on Earth, occurring naturally in sea. What's interesting is tritium is actually produced. It is by a result of fission reactions or fission reactors. It's not produced via fission because Water is used as a coolant, and water in a neutron flux, very low chance, but there's so much water and so much neutron flux that, yeah, water can absorb, occasionally absorb some neutrons, and then you get, and then you get some tritium. Especially heavy water reactors where you're already starting off with deuterium, so you only have to absorb one more neutron. Other than that, you can breed it by bombardium lithium-6 with neutrons, which would then undergo alpha, alpha decay, and you get your helium nucleus and tritium. Making up about 0.02% of hydrogen in seawater. And because deuterium has an extra neutron, it makes that water molecule heavier, giving its name, heavy water. That difference allows us to set- There's a joke since heavy water is often used in the can-do design of nuclear plant that that are used in Canada frequently that they say heavy water is just another word for maple syrup. Yes, it's not that funny. Created through a number of means. Vacuum distillation allows us to take advantage of heavy water's higher boiling point, while the girdler sulfide process separates heavy water through chemical reactions. We can then simply electrolyze the heavy water to separate the deuterium. However, it's another one. one of the issues facing nuclear fusion is the rarity of tritium. Our primary source of tritium is nuclear reactor moderator pools, which are often filled with heavy water. These pools are designed to absorb- Often? I don't know about often, at least within the US. Again, in the Canadian reactors, yes. At the plant I worked at, just use natural, natural water with the natural abundance of hydrogen, albeit heavily heavily purified and mixed in with boric acid for additional reactivity control. Think, think of boric acid as liquid control rods, which you can either raise its concentration or dilute its concentration, but no deuterium above natural abundance. And again, maybe slightly higher just because it's in a neutron field that, that there's a small chance that a given water molecule could have its hydrogen become deuterium just by absorbing a neutron, but that doesn't really count. I wouldn't call that heavy water or deuterated water or anything like that. The high energy neutrons given off during nuclear fusion, and in doing so, they can become tritium, a hydrogen with two neutrons. This source of tritium is becoming less prevalent as nuclear power plants are gradually being shut down around the world due to competition from cheaper forms of electricity. I'm not sure there was ever that much. It was more of like a side thing. I don't actually know if the amount of heavy water plants has changed proportionally that much. Yes, the US has shut down some of its nuclear power plants, but none of them are heavy water, unless you count research reactors or DOE installations that are built for that specific purpose. Currently, total global reserves of tritium are estimated at just 20 kilograms, which is not a lot considering the ITER program, the massively internationally funded fusion generator being built in France at the moment, estimates a commercial reactor will need 300 grams of tritium every day to generate 800 megawatts of electricity. That's not surprising to me at all because there's no demand. For instance, all, almost all of the world's reserves of uranium-235 were tied up in the little boy atomic bomb back in 1945. Note that Fat Man used plutonium-239 primarily. If we, we can always make more. That's, that's not really an issue. <laughs> Didn't stop us from building more nuclear weapons, did it? Power, meaning we would eat through the entire global supply of tritium in just over two months. 800 me That's still a lot longer than eating through the world's supply with one bombing <laughs> in, in 1945. That's is enough to cover about 2% of France's peak power consumption. Even if we could continue sourcing tritium from nuclear fusion reactors, they only produce about 100 grams per year. This is a major problem. However, we do have a solution in mind. We can use the high energy neutrons spit out from the fusion reactions to do a bit of alchemy wizardry. 
When those high energy cycling? neutrons encounter lithium, they can split the lithium into tritium and helium, providing a steady supply of tritium right where it's needed. Yeah, those sort of sites already, those places already exist where, again, we're just not using them because there's no demand. This is done in what is called a blanket around the fusion chamber. The design of the blanket is one of the most challenging parts of a tokamak fusion generator. That's cool though to have it, to have it to built in. Over 180 design variants of this blanket. It's kind of similar to the idea of a breeder reactor, and you'll you'll even see that on the equivalent of that in fission. It's a as a converter, even one. So for it to be considered a breeder, it needs to basically convert more than it actually than it would use. But even at like a basic thermal vanilla nuclear power plant, like the one I worked at, by the end of life, you're fissioning as much as 30 30 percent plutonium because uranium two thirty eight absorbs a neutron, becomes uranium two thirty nine couple of beta decays and then you have plutonium 239 which is a fissile material it's actually more reactive than uranium 235 so reactions are faster towards the end of life because it makes up a greater percent of what you're actually using so this this concept is related to something a concept that exists in fission and it's it's pretty cool line the donut shaped interior because the blanket needs to do a lot more than just breed tritium Put a blanket it is also on your donut. Where the energy of the fusion reaction yes. gets converted to heat. 80% of the energy of a tritium deuterium fusion reaction is carried away by those high energy neutrons in the form of kinetic energy. We need a way to convert that kinetic energy to electricity. As the fusion reaction rages in the center of the magnetically confined plasma, neutrons begin to erupt outwards unaffected by the magnetic field mm. thanks to their neutral magnetic charge. Yep. Tokamaks convert the energy of these tiny particles by slowing them down in the blanket, trading their kinetic energy with atoms in the blanket to heat energy. It's a form of a moderator. It's a little different because mo when I say moderator, I'm talking about in fission slowing down a neutron that it can enough that it can cause fissions. And here we're talking about another form of energy and heat transfer. Heat energy Breeding is then blanket. captured by yeah. high pressure water being pumped through cooling channels, converting it to high pressure steam to drive a steam turbine. Hum and that's so yeah, it's it's the same thing as fission, it's the same thing as coal, it's the same thing as natural gas at this point, if you're talking about just a loop of water that is used to generate steam. This tried and tested method of creating electricity. I love it. Combination of like space age sci-fi stuff with technology from the 1800s. That fulfills this role needs some unique properties. First, in order to optimize for heating and tritium breeding, we need the material to be a neutron multiplier. When the high energy neutron from the fusion reaction enters the blanket wall, we want it to strike an atom inside the blanket and release Beryllium. two neutrons, creating an additional neutron Two or more, preferably. To fulfill both roles, generating heat and tritium. Beryllium is currently the leading candidate for this role. To give you a sense, it's about 2.4 neutrons for uh, fissioning a uranium-235. When the neutron strikes it, it splits into two helium-4 atoms and two neutrons. Beryllium, the same material used for the James Webb Telescope mirrors, is the material of choice because the helium byproduct does not contaminate the plasma and critically the material retains little tritium within itself we need the tritium to naturally escape the metal partially because we need to collect the gas to replenish our fuel but also because tritium is explosive just like normal hydrogen i mean it's hydrogen however beryllium does have its problems the thing about hydrogen being explosive, though, you can have it in a concentration where it's too rich to burn, because it actually can be used in, in a generator, used hydrogen as a blanket there, but if it's kept at a, but we kept it at a concentration well above 95%, though, would still be a hazard if, say, you sprung a leak. First, the sheer quantity of beryllium a commercial fusion reactor will require. Current designs call for between 216 and 560 tons. Wow. This is an issue because... 
that's a lot. That's bigger than... You can have reactor vessels on the order of... At the low end of that, the, the 200 tons, but... And how much power is this thing producing? I'm curious what the power-to-weight ratio of this of this particular design is. Because Eater was a mere 500 megawatts, which is 500 megawatts thermal, which is paltry compared to fission reactors that weigh less than this that can produce 3,000, 3,800 megawatts thermal. And keep that in mind when you're hooking it up to a steam, a steam turbine, you're largely dividing that number by three. So a 3,800, I remember a 3,800 megawatt reactor where I work with good thermal efficiency, so during the winter time, about 1400 megawatts electric, and that's not counting house loads. Helium is extremely expensive due to the limited supply of the material. Annual global supply last year amounted to only 260 tons. The entire annual global supply of beryllium could only just about build <laughs> one generator. Next. I can see what he's getting in now with the problem. We'd have to, in order to build this at scale, we'd need to redefine our manufacturing economy around this sort of thing. But it, it can be done. Like, barely any uranium-235 existed before nuclear fission became a thing. So that is not an unsolvable problem. For safety issues. Beryllium can contain large quantities of uranium. China's beryllium blanket module contains 100 parts per million uranium. So 0.01% of the blanket is composed of uranium. The bigger hazard with that is probably just the toxicity of uranium being a heavy metal. It might as well it might as well be lead or something. I mean, you don't want to inhale the uranium dust either because it is an alpha emitter, which would give you a nasty internal dose. This isn't an issue for most components that are usually made out of beryllium, like the beryllium aluminium copper engine pistons that were banned from Formula One in 2001. Mm. However, it becomes a massive problem when the uranium is exposed to those high energy neutrons. The same kind of neutrons that split uranium for fission reactors. Would not recommend using enriched uranium. Don't put your uranium-235 <laughs> in your beryllium. This creates fissile isotopes, or in other words, it makes the beryllium radioactive. If there were 30 parts per million of uranium to beryllium in a commercial scale fusion reactor, that would mean it contains 17 kilograms of natural uranium and 123 grams of uranium-235, the uranium needed for fission reactors. That's probably not the worst part, actually, because it would be the uranium-238 absorbing a neutron and then decaying into plutonium-239, which is going to be more, which is more reactive. And plus, that'll bring in the whole regulatory thing of uranium-235 and plutonium-239. On the order of grams, that's going to be within the threshold of it being considered special nuclear material, so you're going to have that additional oversight requirements from the from the regulator by special nuclear material means material that could theoretically be used to make a nuclear weapon so fissile material again we're talking the fissile aspect it doesn't include the other working components of a nuclear weapon but there would be that that regulatory concern as well the byproducts of this uranium would make disposing of the blanket at the end of the generator's life incredibly difficult this all points to one major problem Put in a fission reactor. <laughs> Scrape some of that stuff off. Wouldn't that be cool? I see with tokamak. There you go. Make it a big fission fusion hybrid. Yeah, get because you can get the get the tritium from the fission reactor and get the uranium from the fusion reactor. You can create a nice little virtuous cycle. I know this would be very difficult to do, but I kind of like the uh, the duality here. Reactors. Even if we manage to reach net energy output, these generators don't solve the biggest problem holding nuclear energy back, cost. Nuclear fission power is a wonder technology of the last century. It promised abundant, clean, cheap energy, a technology that we scarcely even dreamed of two centuries ago as we first discovered the existence of the atom. The thing with fusion, like any new technology, is going to be far more ex more expensive than fission, at least initially. And that's hence the 20 years away thing. Yet, we are closing down nuclear fission reactors all across the world when we need that clean energy more than ever. And that's the sad thing, that 
Keeping a nuclear power plant online, I talked to this way more about in my reaction to the economics of nuclear video. The amount of pure profit that you would make for extending a license of a nuclear power plant because you already have all of that all of that capital was already used during the construction phase and during the early operational years. That is the biggest hurt on your investment for not continually using it. It's basically the equivalent of withdrawing from your retirement account early. Because it's uneconomical. The cost of building a nuclear fission reactor and dealing with the radioactive byproducts when decommissioning it are the two primary factors making it uneconomical. So basically don't decom- because yeah, decommissioning is going to be an even bigger cost. You're going to whoever's doing it's going to need to take another loan because it's very costly to decommission. So run it for longer. <laughs> You're going to need some long-term thinking investors. Tokamak reactors are driving straight towards the exact same economic problem. However, one company is doing it differently. Helion. The company I visited to witness nuclear fusion reactors and interview their brilliant CEO, David Kirtley. They are doing things completely Is different sponsored to by Helium? everyone else wonder. in nuclear fusion research. They aren't capturing energy with steam power, eliminating the need for costly beryllium blankets. They are developing a method of making fuel on site that doesn't require lithium, instead using the cheap and plentiful deuterium to create it during fusion. and. They are using a completely different magnetic confinement method to achieve They're nuclear using stellarators? fusion temperatures. Next week, we will be releasing a full-length documentary about Helion right here on YouTube. Okay, let me know if you want me to react to the Helion video, but he keeps talking about the whole beryllium blanket. I mean, you could just purify beryllium. The main problems I see with it is, is just the high energy requirements for fusion. Those are the big hurdles, though we are making, we are getting closer and closer. The main problems is the energy input versus output. The eater goal of having a Q number of 20 for getting 20 times the amount of energy produced for cost, that's still not very good. So fission, for instance, at most, I would say about 20 to at most, 30 megawatts, and that's to run all of your large pumps necessary to, to start up the facility. So a Q number north of 40, and we just recently achieved a Q of one. So that that's, that's the biggest challenge. Everything else involving scalability are similar problems you see with any bit of new technology. Let me know what you think the biggest problem with fusion is, or if there really is no problem. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.